So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth edition of Food Talk. Myself Nishant Kashyap. I am editor at Tagma Times Magazine, and we are both for today's session. In the previous four sessions, we have learned about the trends and opportunities in the Indian cooling industry, Indian Indo-German collaboration, smart manufacturing, and its impact on cooling industry, and the role of MSME in nation development. Today we are back with another trending topic: additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing is said to be the game changer in the manufacturing industry. In fact, world over industry experts believe that within this decade, 3D printing will become not just an effective technology to rapidly create prototypes or low volume parts, but competitive enough for mass production of even a large metal component. In fact, there was a news a couple of uh, months back that Volkswagen is planning to 100,000 3D printing parts in a year and the best thing is these parts are said to be almost 50 percent less weight than the conventional one but still uh, with the same strength we'll discuss more on this in today's session with our esteemed guest Ms. deepa srinivasan chief engineer at pratt and whitney r d center bangalore Ms. deepa i welcome you to the fifth edition of cool talk on behalf of tagma and the cooling fraternity welcome ma'am thank, thank you so much now I would like to invite Mr. Shanmugha Sundaram, uh, Vice President of Tagma India, to say a few words about Ms. Deepa. Over to you, sir. Yeah, good evening to everyone. Uh, on behalf of uh, EC and Tagma, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Deepa Srinivasan. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Thanks for your time. And uh, uh, you have consented to be uh, as a chief guest in the tool, tool talk. And about uh, Dr. Deepa Srinivasan is the Chief Engineer at Brent and Whitney, uh, Whitney R&D Center, Bangalore. Deepa Ma'am has a PhD in Metallurgical Engineering from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore and has more than 21 years of total work experience in the area of gas turbine materials. She is the inventor of several new technologies having over 35 patents as developed more than 50 technologies process applications that are running in several gas turbines. She was recently conferred Woman Engineer of the Year 2020 by the Indian National Academy of Engineering. She is an adjudicate fa faculty at IIT Hyderabad, IIT Ropar, visiting faculty at VIT Velour and research professor at Veltech University. Congratulations, madam, for the Woman Engineer of the Year. We are thank you. Very proud of I think I think they and sorry to interrupt you. Thank you for that, but I think people are messaging that you are not audible. Okay. Mr. Shan. Okay. Uh, oh. I'm seeing a lot of messages. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Is it audible, ma'am, now? Uh, to yes. me, you were audible. Some others have written in the chat box. So maybe okay. Mr. Nishant can take care of that. Okay. Okay, ma'am. No, I think even I can hear him. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Me. Congratulations, madam, for the woman of the year. Uh, it's really uh, pride of you. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Uh, yes, take over, Nishant. Please. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Shan. Thank you. So uh, now before we start the conversation, I would request everyone to keep your phone in a mute mode uh, so that and post any kind of questions in the chat box below. Also, uh, you can post the relevant questions in the chat box instead of putting any kind of marketing material. That would be really helpful. Shall we start after this? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so so let me just uh, let me thank uh, Mr. B.K. Sharma first for I think he's the culprit to introduce me to your forum. So uh, we were together in a very animated, nice forum in the in the month of May during lockdown. So uh, let me thank him first and thank you both, uh, Dipali and you and the president and uh, vice president to have uh, called me to the society because. I believe each each new uh, forum is a fantastic learning for me. So, um, thanks for pulling in and uh, this this session. Thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. And it will be a great learning opportunity for us and the cooling fraternity. Yeah. So, uh, 
to start with we can just talk about the trends and development in the field of additive manufacturing because we know that this technology is it's been considered as a disruptive technology uh, but it's been always considered for the prototypes and all however there are reports that it can uh, you know eventually become a mainstream manufacturing technology so what are those new technological development uh, and trends that is happening in this industry Okay. Um, well, I, I heard you say it was it is usually uh, you know meant for prototypes. I think that is long gone um, for many years. I think I see quite a couple of my friends here. They've said hello to me in the chat box. Hitesh is there. A um, few others also, Mr. Prasad. So I think it has stopped being a prototype um, in that sense uh, at least three four years ago. To that extent, people in all industries, including definitely the tooling industry, is one of the um, biggest users of it, irrespective of which tooling it is, whether it's aerospace, space, um, automotive, uh, you know, where where parts don't have to go into the actual, uh, the tool and die is uh, something which is uh, in the tool room. So, uh, you know, in terms of the latest trends, I'll just give you um, my perspective in the Indian context, because it is, I'm really passionate about that. Um, I started working in additive manufacturing in, uh, you know, uh, for part making for the aerospace gas turbine, power generation gas turbines in 2008 and 9, way, way before it became a buzzword actually, because I'd come to that um, in a, a little later in another context where necessity was the mother of invention. So we really didn't have any conventional manufacturing, uh, let's say, to um, restore components which had come back from service exposure. So additive uh, was really an organic solution. Otherwise, we were ending up with a lot of productivity loss and a lot of wastage of very, very expensive parts. So additive came to the rescue. And then I'm jumping about 10 years later from 2009 to maybe 2015. I mean, not 19, but 15. Wherein um, I know that Intech DMLS was one of the first. And before that, I think, um, if I remember right, was Vasanta Tools. Um, you know, you people can correct me. In Hyderabad, some people say um, it is a tool, um, tool and die um, person in Coimbatore. I'm not sure who was the first to actually purchase the first uh, metal 3D printing machine in in. Uh, and I'm only going to be talking about metals um, in this forum because all of you are, you know, looking at actually tooling parts uh, and so on. So I'm not uh, really going to talk about FDM machines and others, which. Um, uh, just for the purpose of this, maybe later we can address. So, the latest trends coming back to that question. First, I'll talk about the uh, the whole uh, how it is boomeranged in terms of in in the Indian context itself in just five years, where there was one or two or three machines. Uh, today, I mean, some of you may know the statistics better than me, but at least I know that there are projections for 150 machines. Um, out of which 145 are of the powder bed fusion type using the laser. I think two or three are the direct energy deposition. Where I'm sitting right now, they have one machine installed at the Indian Institute of Science uh, about a year ago during the lockdown. So um, what I'm saying is just in terms of the uh, huge interest, five years is a very short time. And uh, that itself is a big, big trend in terms of affordability of these machines. Um, in kind, in, in in it's all pervasive in all sectors. Now, if you talk about the latest technological trends, then um, we are jumping towards the end of the talk itself. But uh, it is in terms of multiple materials. It is in terms of hybrid manufacturing. Um, you know, uh, how can you right now? You can only and how can you use materials which are more esoteric? And of course, the availability of any kind of uh, chemistry of powders today uh, at very short notice. This was not the case even two years ago, um, even three years ago. Today, we have almost, um, you know, I don't know, maybe 30, 40, 50 powder manufacturers um, that can do any types of parts. So, and, you know, multi materials, functionally graded materials, multi materials. And they are also talking about enormous hybrid machines. Machines okay. that can not only do a layer by layer digital digital uh, manufacturing, let's call this as digital manufacturing, uh, as goes the definition of additive manufacturing. So that can also do the machining, that can do part heat treatment, that can also give you a finally, um, you know, machine engineer in its shape part. Yeah. yeah. 
Right. So, uh, thanks for uh, you know chatting out those trends that is shaping up in the industry. So now uh, something related to your work. So you're working currently with one of the leading aerospace company. Could you tell us a little bit about the work you are doing and how you are applying electric manufacturing to your you know, electric manufacturing? Sure. Then you then you'll have to sit and listen for another five hours <laughs> because I can't stop talking. Then <laughs> yeah. So um, I I'll go back. Uh, well, uh, within uh, reasonable, I'll I'll talk about the last five six years. Uh, in fact, where we. Um, uh, combining not just the two years where I, I mean, I'm in the present company, but I think one of the biggest things we've seen as additive is a low hanging fruit. And um, I'm sure you may have the question uh, how, how it is and, um, you know, um, especially in the aerospace industry. I think there are five performance matrices uh, for um, additive man metal additive manufacturing and ASTM, uh, American Society of Testing of Materials has actually classified into seven buckets, um, the whole additive manufacturing and they keep adding and revising every quarter, um, you know, in terms of um, is it laser, is it an electron beam, is it a uh, you know, powder just heating like a sintering, like a powder metallurgy route, which you are all very familiar with, um, and so on and so forth. There are many more coming up actually. Uh, but uh, the way we have used it, the five performance matrices, I think all the five are very much applicable to the tooling industry. I'll start yeah. with something which is very, um, you know, which is very close to all your hearts, which is basically we want all want maximum in the eight or ten or twelve hours a day or twenty four hour shift. Uh, in our respective manufacturing sectors. So first to start with is productivity enhancement, I would say. Then uh, comes into how we can minimize wastage and uh, you know how we even in the tooling industry, wh why to take a big block and keep machining out, uh, you know, the cooling channels. It's such a wastage of material. So uh, in other words, we say simplicity of parts. Uh, and um, then we are also talking, especially in the aerospace industry, but it doesn't matter which, even in the locomotive industry, if, uh, if I'm able to make, uh, I think last week I saw a nice article about uh, one of uh, very, very high strength steels uh, for the transportation uh, industry. Uh, that is transportation means, I mean rails. So anybody is interested in reducing the weight uh, so that per volume, uh, your cost or your return on investment is always so particularly in aerospace industry uh, and in the gas turbine hotter and lighter really are the two common buzzwords because um, you know don't we all want to when things open up don't we all want to you know fly from uh, for our businesses or, or pleasure uh, we don't want to sit we don't have the patience to sit through 16 hours in a flight or 20 hours for that matter to go from so hotter and lighter both these enable better thrust higher thrust and therefore um, you know flying times into high speed civilian transport and so on so that's a third performance metric then we of course we're talking about performance enhancement anything efficiency is good we don't want the tool breaking we don't want chips we don't want burrs we don't want things to cause failure later crack parts uh, and so on. So that is another performance metric. But where, um, since you asked my experience, yeah, above all this, you know, because you remember additive is, is still one of the most expensive manufacturing um, technologies, one of, relatively speaking, one of the lower in terms of the productivity, in terms of churning out parts. So it, that, that's still being there in developments and enhancements, uh, everybody is doing it. We need to make sure that we, for each of our businesses, our, you know, MSMEs or our big businesses or, um, you know, whatever we run for our product line, we'd like to make sure that we take the best return on investment uh, with one yeah. or two of these performance metrics. So, in my uh, opinion, in the aerospace industry, even to do the trials, uh, you know, now as well as many years before, you know, qualification and certification is huge. You know, to qualify one aerospace part from a conventional machined uh, milling CNC mills to um, uh, an additive, it is it is several millions of dollars. So, uh, especially if it is a commercial air, aircraft with human beings in, uh, in place. So, where I used it all through um, in my previous organization um, was in um, utilizing the metallurgical aspects of it. So the low hanging fruit was to use additive as a unique application and it so happens uh, most of the time it was hybrid additive on conventional uh, really um, i have 
95 percent i have only worked on that and um, additive powder bed or laser di direct energy deposition or electron beam melting and as i said i've only worked on methods so um, all these um, you know on conventional investment cast parts or regular uh, conventional cast parts or forged parts or fabricated items so i've really uh, found the return on investment for productivity gains and also for metallurgical uh, advantage in terms of using the hybrid for enhanced uh, properties and component life. So um, that's what I've been doing successfully and wherein we have been, uh, been able to take from an ideation uh, to a prototyping, that means proof of concept at the laboratory scale. Uh, the idea could be from our own team, myself or my team members or from anybody, anybody that we come across it can be from a university. And um, then we've developed it in our lab, partnering with a whole bunch of people and then taking it to technology readiness level four. That means flagging off saying this is design certified at all the uh, due diligence. Then go on to do the um, large scale. Large scale means what? Build more number of parts um, in about three to four months time, looking at the heat transfer, looking at the effectiveness of being able to build without distortions, with dimensional tolerance, residual stress management. And then go from technology business level five all the way to eight, handshake it with the production. So uh, I've done about a dozen of these, uh, actually, to be precise, 12 of them in aerospace applications, uh, particularly. And what, yeah. I currently, what I'm doing right now in the last uh, two years, sitting in an academic institution, more of R towards D um, rather than uh, D towards application. That's the nature of my job now is uh, we've been evaluating a whole bunch of um, um, new alloys. You know, um, you need a lot of due diligence when you're looking at new alloys because um, um, additive is still, it's still, uh, what can I say? It's a fascinating as far as metallurgy is concerned, um, uh, you know, because it's it's a rapid solidification. It is It doesn't follow the laws of conventional manufacturing. So um, the manufacturers or the um, uh, People have to pay a lot of attention. Definitely, I'm very happy because more metallurgists will get engaged and they'll, they won't be jobless. Mechanical engineers can do whatever they want, but uh, I'm just joking. Definitely, it's a field which definitely needs a metallurgist always by your side. So what I've been doing is primarily new alloy um, uh, evaluation. Of course, along with that, we've also been looking at uh, from the past legacy, what are the failures to expect in additive. So if you take, I'll just quickly give you a ruling example. Supposing you got a new part made um, one of you, you know, a couple of years ago, um, you know, quickly for conformal cooling or better things. And if it failed, um, you don't have answers to it now. Nobody has answers because the people who are making it are very busy making the right part. Um, and, you know, they have to make two ends meet now uh, because they've invested in the machine, they've invested in the people. And all of you are bold, I mean, all the industries are bold enough to try one or two parts, which means they don't know what to expect when something fails. So I've been uh, working quite a bit in the aerospace alloys on what to anticipate in terms of lifing of an additive part. You know, so two parts. So just to summarize, I think we'll revisit it later. In the first uh, six or eight or 10 years for the gas turbine industry, I spent a lot of time in um, low hanging fruits. Um, not quite replacing, as I said, hybrid manufacturing for repair and refurbishment of uh, very, very high-end alloys, cobalt alloys, nickel alloys, some very high-end martensitic steels, um, as well as titanium alloys. And then now, more recently, I'm working on new alloy develop. I mean, how do you qualify absolutely brand new materials uh, very quickly with the legacy knowledge? Um, I'm also looking at failure Yeah, okay. That's nice. So, uh, in between, you also said that it is very expensive technology and also there are still limitations when it comes to the speed and the materials we can use. So do you think these are some of the challenges that is still uh, stopping this technology for a uh, you know, uh, large penetration in the SMEs or the any other manufacturing industry? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Um, it is still expensive. It is still, uh, oh, I'll just give you a quick example. I don't know the current price of steel, but about a year ago, I think before the lockdown, let's say it's about, I'm just exaggerating, let's say 100, 100 uh, rupees a kilogram. And let's say you want to make a part which is 10 kilograms. 
and given yeah. all the you know you'll take a block you, even the machining and then the transportation and the profit everything put together the whole part i'm just doing the math will not be more than 2500 rupees uh, that you would sell you know some insert or something like that let's say for a closed eye forging of a small valve and um, the same small part which is 6 inches by 8 inches um whatever the same design if you're going to 3d print it it is at least even in the steel um first of all you may or may not get the exact uh, steel that you're looking for uh, let's say a p92 or uh, any any kind of uh, tool and die steel anything that you're currently using with a very low price you may not get it or let's say you want a mild steel um, definitely mild steel is not 3d printable at the moment so one of the challenges is yes it is still a low um, throughput process so i know uh, not, uh, not the tooling industry but then your customers you know the automotive or the aerospace or the space everybody is your customer right the, the tool industry everybody is a customer so um, uh, you know if they are looking to churn out many many parts per day um, even in the aerospace you know in investment casting unless it's a single crystal or a directly solidified we look at uh, pouring the liquid um, you know for most of the nozzles vanes all the hot section components in the high pressure turbine which really runs uh, we're looking at hundreds and thousands of parts per day of course post processing everything may take about uh, 15 20 days um, so it is still um, a slow uh, process it is still um, uh, an expensive so i said it's at least three times more even for Uh, so how many people can afford that and the productivity but one of the biggest challenges is um, you know people will say you can do with minimal uh, machining afterwards and i have attended many imtma forums uh, being in bangalore of course and um, uh, you know of course i know all the people the stalwarts there i think many times people will question saying uh, is the machining industry going to be out of uh, business in 20 years very very unlikely because what goes by conventional manufacturing it's working good it has tried and tested properties as i said these performance matrices um uh, each industry has to choose what is the low hanging fruit for them so the challenge we we'll talk more about the challenges but uh, definitely apart from the two i highlighted i've highlighted one more um you know which is um uh, the productivity i mentioned i mentioned the cost uh, i also mentioned that you do need to do post processing so uh, it's not like it's you don't have to do any all of you know that and sometimes because of the accessibility that is also a, there are a lot of technical challenges but uh, we'll come to the technical challenges one of the operational challenges um, here i would say is there aren't that many 3d printing machines uh, all over yet unlike okay. uh, you know for example if you take a milling i mean right here in bangalore we have uh, you know my good friends are from the as micromatics group i mean they churn out like several uh, per day i think it's uh, you know several uh, several tens of machines are being built per day so yeah i i don't think it has reached that yet that is also a challenge i know that because we faced it in the fuel nozzle example as you all know the famous uh, leap engine fuel nozzle um that was first qualified in the by fa in the ge leap engine so when we wanted to make i mean the number of parts given the number of um planes that fly and the number of engines per number of fuel nozzles in each part it was like some i think 10000 or uh, some parts per month or something like that i don't remember the number but definitely about few thousands so there were no there were no 3d printing machines to make it and today also that is a challenge even this earlier this week we faced that challenge so then what we say is um, you know imagine the 10 machines are there we have to qualify all of them make sure the production the line is running um uh, you know even if you digitize it even if you go into the uh, digital manufacturing route today industry 4.0 um yeah. you know the whole thing takes a finite time and um, then even last uh, earlier this week um, i i, I won't be able to share details of what it is we said oh forget it let's go with conventional manufacturing you know the uh, that's also a, so there are many operational challenges um, especially for aerospace uh, parts but it works good for all industries yeah so as you said that there are many in machine to industry who believe that this is a kind of a threat to their technology but also said that this is highly unlikely to happen 
but uh, it is also believed that additive manufacturing will replace tooling up to certain point, but will also add a lot of value to the tool maker. So, how these two scenarios will work together, and what are the various ways tool makers can start their uh, you know additive manufacturing journey? Because tool makers are also small companies, and as you said, that they are you know they fall under SME, which is expensive technology. So, how should they actually start their additive manufacturing journey? Sure. I'm sorry, but the first part of your question, your voice broke. Can you repeat it? So I was just saying that, uh, you know, uh, in tooling industry also, it is believed that, you know, it will replace tooling up to a certain point, but also add a lot of value in the tool making industry, more making. So how these two scenarios? Yeah. In fact, I think uh, one of the best users of it could be the tooling industry, because uh, first of all, the parts are not rotating. Okay. And secondly, um, um, it's not easy, but like the aerospace, where, you know, just to give an example, in the aero engine itself, as you all know, the I'll just give the aero engine or the internal combustion engine, our automotive. Uh, today, the modern automotive engine doesn't have to be even a Tesla or a BMW or a Mercedes, even a normal um, engine, horsepower engine, two, three horsepower engine, um, or the aero engine is almost the whole engine is like a, giant heat exchanger especially the aircraft engine whether it's military or it's commercial and even the power generation turbines they are practically there are thousands of heat exchangers the reason i'm relating that to the tooling is you're also uh, tooling industry is primarily working to enhance the heat exchange you know um, the better uh, it is the better the part is there's no warpage there's no shrinkage the number of parts that are able to be produced um, per minute or per hour is much more. So uh, when we're looking at this kind of, um, that's why I said, so in the aircraft industry, the best uh, low hanging product, not the turbine blade, not the rotor, not the vane, not the disc, uh, but the maximum utilization of additive manufacturing as goes the definition and the performance metrics is the heat exchanger. Uh, because uh, you know, it's very, very difficult to uh, extract away the heat. More important than that, to manufacture those tubes, um, you know, by multiple processes, welding, brazing, and uh, you, and it's not even the design for manufacturing. It is um, uh, also that you are not able to let the design engineer imagine the best heat extraction available. So there is a handicap out there. Uh, there is an additive, both for aircraft industry as well as the tooling industry. Uh, you can do design for additive manufacturing and defy the imagination of the designer. Uh, that is a true potential in terms of design. Are you able to? So what are the advantages for the tooling industry? I mentioned a few, but, um, you know, you, right now you want to have, uh, you know, kind of cooling channels. Conformal cooling um, is a big, a big uh, process. It's practically uh, inaccessible by your conventional machining techniques. Number one. Yeah. Number two is that uh, you know the the tool and die itself is you know you want them to last forever and ever because they're so bulky and when you're pouring hot metal, especially for injection molding and high pressure die casting uh, and many other even for hot die forging, even for closed die forging. Um, you know, tooling is one of the most important things. The whole assembly will stop if something, if there's a tiny crack or some something happens in tooling, it can even lead to safety hazards, as you all know. So, yeah. um, so there, the conformal cooling, uh, I mean, it, I, I think in the last three to four years, at least from 2016 um, uh, uh, onwards, in, in fact, I would say that, um, at least to my knowledge, in the shop floor, in the since 2013 that I've been following up, I think the number of trials, uh, at least in the gas turbine industry, has been made with additive manufacturing, the tool and that, um, you know, in our sector, I'm saying, um, because um, we are able to get radial cooling, we are able to get axon, uh, axial cooling, we are able to get serpentine cooling, um, you know, all kinds of cooling um, we are able to get in the tool um, in order to make um, you know, not just for the productivity, we're not so worried. Yes, that is important, but to make the best component with uh, uh, without any dimensional distortions or residual stress buildup, and to make sure that the number of parts uh, defects are reduced. So when we did a Six Sigma uh, in 2011 and 12, I was part of the Black Belt Six Sigma in engineering productivity ma management globally. 
uh, when I was yeah. in uh, GE Oil and Gas. That's when we really introduced the tool and die for the first, even long before we started the prototyping of other um, parts, which are actual parts for the rotating turbo machinery. We implemented additive manufacturing the tool and die only. Uh, as I told you, because it's it's not a rotating component, it's a stationary component, and um, and uh, the other uh, advantage is additive. Uh, the sixth one, which I left to mention when you would ask the question, is the fact that it is a customized design. So though I told you that it's a low volume production and it's a little slow, uh, why is ISRO, for example, uh, able to use this or NASA both both these? space organizations you would have seen in the US are one of the in the aerospace industry they are the, one of the prolific um, users of uh, metal additive manufacturing because theirs is like one time use it through you know, when a space shuttle goes out they are not going to that there are many many types of engines for many many launches and um, you know one time design this is the best uh, solution so um, coming back to you know to the tool and die industry, I think it has uh, it has enormous potential. I believe the latter half of your question is how can the MSMEs and all the tool rooms make best use of it? Am I right? Yeah, that yeah. was the second part of your question. So um, I think you know um, as I said, it is still an expensive technology. It it still needs uh, quite a different skill set. I mean, you know, every single mechanical engineer or, or any engineer can pick it up. It's not so difficult to be honest. Those who have done uh, basic engineering um, or even diploma, I think, can quickly pick up. But um, uh, you know, it's not picking up at the peripheral level. So for the smaller MSMEs who don't have large pockets, I mean, you may have, but still you may be thinking about, you know, which is the right way to invest. I would say today in India, we have at least 20, 25 service providers, um, yeah. you know, uh, almost in every major city. Um, if not, I think everything, almost about out of 22 IITs, I think about seven, eight have. And uh, NITs, a few of them have a um, few other uh, private engineering. I'm just, I'm just giving out. And some national labs have it. And you know, uh, I think in uh, Orissa, the tool room, uh, those people have a, quite a few machines. Of course, they're all heavily booked. Like the same challenge, operation challenge I mentioned, the third operation challenge. There aren't enough machines because it's a slow process. So um, only, you know, I would say utilize the expertise that service providers have built in. Uh, it, it's a win-win situation for me at the moment. And, uh, you know, that would be a first step to start with because they have the design team. They are good at manufacturing. They've done the qualification for that particular. Let's say you want to do a margin steel or a H13 or a, I don't know, tool steel or you want to do a hybrid, um, you know, because you want to do additive on conventional because additive is too expensive. Uh, only where your, where your cooling needs to be done, the bulk of it can be a forged material. So I would re definitely recommend start with, um, you know, four or five years ago, there weren't this many service providers. Neither were they adapted this technology. Uh, they were still, uh, they are having invested um, in the machine, including even in the universities. Today, even several ongoing master students are able to just get on uh, because the machines have also improved. The software has improved uh, by the OEMs. And there are also people like, um, you know, all the um, traditional FEM people, entertainment yeah. modeling and the fluid dynamics people have also pitched, everybody's pitching into this for enhancement. So optimized solutions, if you if you give a particular design, I think uh, in a very short time, uh, it is able to churn out the optimum design. Uh, of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit, uh, but nevertheless, that is a good place to start without investing too much. Uh, of course, uh, if you assembly line, uh, you can afford it uh, by all means and, um, you know, you see the need for such a uh, throughput production, um, you know, of course. The other option is also to lease machines. People are also working in that model where you can, uh, you know, you can have a partnership um, and so on. Okay. So, uh, if, if we take a real life example, uh, let's consider there is a small tool room with all the necessary machines and technologies to, you know, manufacture uh, molds for uh, automotive and other aerospace and all such industries. Now, the owner wants to start, uh, you know, uh, 
conformal cuisine related activities or additive manufacturing you know selling says at his own premises because he has getting lot of so what are the various ways he can you know start these activities how we can embrace the technology and it, if he has to start in house uh, you know additive manufacturing well they jokingly i would say go and poach somebody who's already worked in this field in some other company <laughs> yeah for all of you who are from the oems please pardon me for that but i see that happening all the time so i thought uh, you know i would mention that yeah i mean i think um, uh, in terms of skill set i think uh, as a whole country and i don't know if mr sharma is there but we discussed this extensively during uh, another panel meeting where we met what kind of skill sets um, that somebody can recruit from i would yeah. say i mean as i said uh, a few of the um, institutions and also the tatas were going to uh, start um, skill development in this i think imtma is already also thinking of it i know in iac um, uh, the there is a samarth udyog um, um, you know program that is going on by the department of heavy industries um that they also have to incubate a few other universities in the country as part of this grant and they have people with uh, design skills both in conventional manufacturing and additive manufacturing they have right you know five minutes from where i'm sitting they built a beautiful model uh, factory with both uh, and how do you integrate uh, this whole uh, you know whole thing with i don't know with robotics and uh, everything the whole industry 4.0 which is not bereft of conventional manufacturing so i think you can look for people at least when you recruit um, you know when a in room uh, a businessman wants to do um, yes. as i said with three you know they there are also executive programs that many people are launching i saw one uh, in the whatsapp group a couple of days ago it keeps coming so basic mechanical engineering skill set yes and if the person has an aptitude for digital um, you know learning um as a skill i don't think you need a specialized skill um okay. if a tool room owner wants to start it but i mean if somebody has prior experience definitely even if it is for a year their thinking is aligned towards um, you know um, g codes and towards programming towards optimization support structures um, overhangs how do you you know optimize the process parameters and so on hands on uh, training on the machine is not very difficult though i have done it myself i've seen uh, a lot and lots and lots um, of people buy it and acquire it um, yes. it can be acquired it's it's not very difficult i mean for people who do cnc programming um, this is not that difficult to be honest within one one and a half or maybe three months it can be a good a reasonably good aptitude person can be trained i think the investment for a typical person to procure i think the key here is to uh, i i would say to some extent the challenge is to find your customers uh, if you're selling a, if you're investing all this and let's say i'm just picking an automotive uh, person mahindra and mahindra simply because about an hour ago a friend of mine from there called me i'm just um, uh, collect so supposing to convince them to pay you know this much more um So even though there's conformal cooling, even though it's phenomenal, um, th- that is a little bit of a challenge. You know? It's it's not a, um, uh, and I I'm not sure that investment maybe is about I don't know for a small machine. I'm only talking of laser powder right now. Um, I think it's of the order of five crores or something. I mean everything put together, you know, the infrastructure and. You also have people like uh, you know CMTI. and a few others i mentioned i forget the name of the tool room in orissa i think it's in bhubneshwar i have met the gentleman many times um, there's also you know german tool room there are many people who are working on this also so as i said you know you can um, and they do take a lot of interns people who have finished bachelors masters who are looking for other opportunities go and spend about a year in a, at least in a place like cmti so definitely you can look out for those talents who have had prior training and thinking in this uh, particular got it. just couple of more questions man uh, before we stop uh, the conversation i would request everyone to put their questions that cttc bhubneshwar yeah thank you for that okay that uh, dr deepa can address later just after five minutes so uh, right another question is 
it is believed that digital manufacturing will play a key role in transforming the you know, current manufacturing sector. So, what role adaptive manufacturing is going to play in this current transformation? Okay. Well, additive is, I think, is one of the four prongs when, when, they, when they line up a course on Industry 4.0, it is, it is a part and parcel of it. Uh, but it is not, uh, I won't say it, it is like a subset. When people are talking, when you when you look at, for example, even in Bangalore, I, I visited, um, I think, um, a couple of, uh, you know, conventional uh, big industries. Uh, which have transformed themselves uh, and continue to do to do so in autom automation. I've been through many steel plants where they're doing organic automation without calling it as digital. Only in the last four or five years, it got coined as digital, isn't it? Every all through, when we're looking at the next industrial revolution, people are trying to automate to the extent possible. Uh, primarily, um, I think uh, again this goes back to the Toyota thing of you know how can we. Um, uh, six sigma basically how can we have fewer defects and ensure productivity so um so additive is going to be i would say it's not uh, so supposing you had three um milling let, let's say a, um, a small msme person has three one uh, turning machine one grinding milling machine and one grinding machine and he wants them to talk to each other instead of an operator removing uh, or even in a milling machine, how can you automatically, you know, the tool where when you're doing 24 hours, a uh, huge component when it's doing slow milling, uh, all those are organically being done and little, little improvements is what is constituting to digital manufacturing. Of course, yeah. complete digital manufacturing is a phenomenal thing that uh, I've seen in a video by colleagues several times in uh, robotics, you know, in Toyota as well as in, in Farouk and ABB, uh, where... Um, manufacturing cars all there's no human being there in fact there are no lights there because uh, there's only one operator uh, sitting somewhere there just looking at the car um, and uh, everything is done it, it's phenomenal because everything is done by robots you just need electricity and um, from start to finish so um, in that sense i think it has been organically proceeding in some sectors always um, in some sectors it's a little bit slower uh, but uh, how does additive manufacturing play a role? I mean, I think the very definition is that you are uh, inputting, um, you know, directly. Uh, even six months ago, we were only talking of CAD geometry into additive. Now they are talking of directly, not of going to CAD because sometimes when you uh, when you transfer the CAD model into a G code, you may lose some information. And imagine in a turbine blade. Um, you know, if I lose some information, I'm not going to be able to have the, you know, that particular location 3D printed. In a conventional machining, at least there is bulk. And obviously that's so dangerous. You know? So people are talking of uh, directly incorporating. So I think, uh, um, so to me, additive is definitely a subset of it, just goes by definition. Um, and whether, uh, whether it will be a complete assembly line, um, you know, in terms of a digital thread, I think only time will say. So, uh, one last question my, from my side, uh, which is I, I usually ask to all the speakers at the end, is uh, what would be your suggestions to toolmaker in regards to adoption of uh, additive manufacturing? Uh, I'm sorry, what would be my suggestion to? Toolmakers, small makers in regards to additive manufacturing. Oh, yeah, I, I think we addressed this before. I think definitely they should jump into it, um, especially for, uh, you know, enhancing, especially if the customers can uh, afford to, um, you know, it is still a little on the expensive side now, but uh, definitely they should embrace it because we are trying our best in heat exchangers. Some of them are successful, not all of them, especially in flying machines. Uh, but that is the only way to go. First of all, it is going to, enhance the productivity, it is going to make your tool life longer, um, which means you can use your uh, time to make more tools. Um, I mean, increase your business, expand your business. Um, you know, what would take about a month to make a huge, let's say, um, a forged, uh, forging uh, with heat treatment and so on. So I would definitely say at least embrace it in one or two parts to start with, one or two uh, designs uh, to start with. Um, uh, of course, uh, as I said, you know, not all of them because of footprint, um, there is a constraint as on date, 
that means if you want to make a, if i want to make a i don't know a six feet by five feet close die forge tool right now you can only do it by you know making it into parts and then joining it of course you can do that also but uh, if you want to make a monolithic part then there is a little bit of a constraint to do on the footprint of powder bed manufactured machines and uh, typically the other technologies electron beam and uh, direct energy deposition uh, are not such a big advantage for the tool room industry right now uh, because the additive is the best because you're able to uh, get conformal cooling uh, designs as i said which is absolutely mind-blowing for uh, from a design standpoint so uh, my recommendation would be definitely um, you know engage with somebody you know do an r d and uh, absolutely because more importantly you, you shouldn't be left behind also no because uh, really that's the end thing now in, you know, so left behind in this uh, in terms of technology not that the others will become obsolete but at least use yeah. it to the advantage in terms of uh, uh, you know expanding your business um, your respective businesses that that's going to definitely help right thanks thank you ma'am thank you for making some suggestions to tool makers also highlighting the trends and opportunities in the additive manufacturing and also highlight uh, talking about the new developments in the right so without in, wasting any more time i'll just take two questions from the audience to the audience you, you can pose the questions uh, so there is this question from mr gopal krishnan he says in your opinion how has the recent pandemic affected tooling market especially that related to aerospace oh aerospace is really bad doing very badly because none of us have left our homes right nobody has flown um, yes. at least it was really bad um, i think now it's nice it's looking up all the planes are flying so um, i mean at least in a limited fashion we are all still asked to stay at home otherwise i'm pretty yes. sure wherever uh, i don't know whichever part we would have all flown some of us even for today's meeting so aerospace industry is looking up now um, but uh, it had taken a huge hit absolutely uh, only those commercial uh, commercial uh, aerospace industry had, uh, was practically um, I, i still remember last april last january i had a certain amount of budget and so on last april 15th it came to zero then slowly you know like water droplets started trickling now yeah. i mean i'm where about 10% we are we are we are 10% um, you know marching ahead however those people who had military um, you know the military the defense and military just like healthcare i think these two industries will always um, never can you cannot afford you have to pump all your um, resources and money into healthcare and into defense so um, military in, uh, military aerospace is still it's doing good right so uh, there is another question from mr nina he says how can an additive manufacturing service provider which uh, ex will expand from tool and die sector to highly specialized domain such as aerospace uh, i'm sorry um, how how It's, does uh, first part of how, it how can additive manufacturing service provider will expand from tool and die sector to highly specialized sector like aerospace no actually it uh, it is uh, actually as far that's the beauty and advantage from a business standpoint i think in additive manufacturing um definitely some of the people who are attending this may be service providers i'm sure they will be happy to answer this more than me but since i work for a service provider for a, a brief uh, while and interacted with several now um, now and in the last 10 years Uh, globally as well i can say that uh, it is not a big deal to transition at all because that's a beauty you know healthcare you can even go to healthcare sector it's just that you need to get the right certifications uh, if you want your parts to be in that particular sector it can be aerospace it can be space it can be automotive so actually it is one big advantage unlike the conventional manufacturing where um, if you have a machining line uh, let's say some of you have a business of a machining line obviously you don't have the leeway because your tool and everything will be uh, set for that you can't remove that and then you know your inserts everything have to be tailored to a new um, you know sector product but in additive it doesn't matter at all whatever you want you can print depending on the material of construction 
Uh, and of course, the parameter uh, parameters of the part have to be optimized. The geometry has to be optimized, but that is true for all. So uh, to uh, precisely answer uh, Mr. Avin or whoever's question, okay. yeah, uh, it I think it's one of the mm, relatively speaking, it is one of the easiest sectors to switch between completely variable sectors. Absolutely, uh, I don't see any challenge there. Of course, That's get the business is uh, that is that is not in my domain. So that is all your marketing and sales skills. Yeah, right. So there's this another question from Mr. Sakti. How many years it will take to completely transfer from subtractive manufacturing to additive manufacturing in tooling industry? Um, well, it depends on. Um, uh, well, I don't think you need to transition completely. First of all. Uh, because there are some advantages with the conventional manufacturing. We spoke about many of that. So yeah. it, again, not just the tooling industry, but I say that even for the aerospace, even for the automotive. Right now, right now, meaning I see in the last, if you discount 2020, um, let's say from 2018, there is a huge buzz and a hype. Um, everybody wants to get into that. I, I beg to differ there. I don't think we need to transform completely at all because what works well in an in an industry we must take that and keep it but you know i'm sure you i, I can understand what you're trying to say how do we transform uh, very um, you know seamlessly from one to the other and you know in terms of adaptability in in a shop floor or in a, in the company i think you just need to look at you, i would say you know split it into two um, or whatever two divisions, uh, one is for additive and one is for subtractive. Let one feed into the other continuously, uh, yes. depending on the businesses. Right. I, I think that will be the best transformation because there'll be lessons learned from both. For example, you do have to do post processing of this. For example, you are taking too much time in a uh, subtractive manufacturing. So you may want to do some of those uh, tool and die using additive to show the benefit as we discussed. So to definitely, I, I not just in tool and die, but in any industry, I don't see a completely. Uh, for example, I can't make a, a a crankshaft with additive manufacturing. What is the big advantage there? You know, for example, whereas if you look at uh, ISRO and NASA, they're making huge, um, you know, uh, several meters long, uh, 1.5, 2.53 meter long, um, um, you know, casings for the rockets and so on. That's a one time thing, so they can uh, they can do that. So uh, an additive is the best, as I told you, because you can qualify it on the job uh, on yes. the uh, fly. So I would suggest if you can, if you definitely want to seamlessly have both at the same time um, and uh, use, uh, you know, seamlessly do the transformation. Right. There's one last question I can see uh, from Mr. Lokes. Is there any material recommended for food and medical products? Uh, okay, you mean to say pharmaceutical? Yeah, I think medical products and food grade. I think he's talking about the food grade material and medical products, maybe the glasses and boxes. Uh, okay, I think um, I know that the food industry um, uses tons of uh, food and jewelry industry are one of the largest breadwinners of additive manufacturing uh, world over. Uh, Titan and uh, you know at least all of them. I'm I'm really not sure about um, ingestible materials and what would be the advantage. Maybe I'm not understanding your question correctly. Uh, but uh, all these industries are already using it for uh, you know developing um, not the not the final product. Uh, not the drug or something, but definitely the machinery uh, for, you know, for de development of the drug. For example, Syngene Biocon has a number of um, polymeric 3D printing machines. Um, and so also, uh, you will all know, I mean, Johnson & Johnson, Stryker, and then all these people are one of the pioneers in metal 3D printing. Uh, for, um, uh, implants and so on. Uh, I'm not sure I understood your question, but food industry, chocolate industry, confectionery all over the world, lint, all the Swiss, um, you know, the famous Swiss chocolates. Um, I mean, they're all the first to adapt uh, additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Yeah. Right. I'm seeing one comment saying there is no limit, uh, Mr. Partle, I think. 
There's no limit to the materials for tooling application. Earlier, only margin steels, steel was an option, but now there are very good grades available for all applications. I think it is true, but I would put a word of caution there because even in different grades of margin steel, um, you know, uh, or even in tool steel, you need to, because it is rapid solidification, you may be able to print the um, tooling, but you, you're not prepared, as I said, for the tooling failures unless you qualify it just like you do any other material. Yeah. Right. So we don't have any more questions, I guess. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and uh, giving your time, valuable time for the team talk session. I'm sure we have learned, we all have learned a lot in today's session. Thank you so much. I thank, thank you, you again thank from you. the uh, yeah. Customer management. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Good day to everybody. Thanks to audience as well for joining in for today's session. Uh, keep sharing your suggestions and uh, feedback about the sessions, and definitely we'll be back in four weeks time with another session. Thank you, Deepa, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Good day. Bye bye.